So now moving on to explain how leaders in healthcare can set themselves up for growth and success in these times, we have with us next Mr. James G. Wettrick, CEO of the Wettrick Group of Companies, who will speak on the topic post-pandemic leadership pivots. Please give a nice round warm of applause for him. It's uh, fabulous to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I've already met a lot of great people. Normally I go to meetings where I see the same people over and over again. So it's so enriching and rewarding to be in a group um, where I really don't uh, know anybody, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, I teach uh, marketing and advertising uh, part-time at Texas Wesleyan University, so I'm always keeping my eye out for ads and things. Um, and this was from the Wall Street Journal recently. It's not necessarily a great picture, but Lancome Corporation is uh, running an ad saying how much they appreciate and love and want to thank the nurses uh, during this uh, pandemic, which I thought was, was really wonderful. Uh, Tim Russert, who was a TV journalist and 16-year host of NBC's Meet the Press, once said, the greatest exercise of the human heart is to bend down and pick somebody up. And I venture to say that everybody in this room over the last year or so has had a lot of exercise of your hearts. Um, I want to thank everybody um, who's played an important role in helping people get through this situation. We'll talk a lot about the mental stress that's been involved with this, and I know um, you know what I'm talking about. Healthcare is the business we're in. Healthcare is the business we're in, but the magic that we do, the magic that we do is the why that we do what we do. I've spent uh, 40 years in healthcare. I spent the first 10 years of my life and my career working in hospitals. Um, I helped set up the University Health System Consortium, which is a large alliance of the nation's university hospitals. Uh, that now merged with VHA to become known as Vizient. I've spent 20 years in the pharmaceutical and medical device business. I worked 11 years for Abbott Labs and uh, for eight years for a portfolio company of the Wallenberg family, the richest family in Sweden that owns a firm called Investor AB, which is a lot like Berkshire Hathaway. And I've had my own business for 10 years consulting with medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies, and hospitals, and I've worked with over um, a hundred uh, companies. And my focus now uh, in the twilight years of my career and my life is working on executive coaching and mentoring and leadership development, which I'm spending a lot of time doing. This quote from uh, A Tale of Two Cities in my mind captures a lot of my thoughts about this situation. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and uh, we've all lost somebody I'm sure close as a result of this situation, and um, it's been very difficult. Our fight is continuing, nonetheless. We still are not into the safe territory. Um, and as Churchill said, uh, he said a lot of things that I really admire, it's courage to continue that counts. Well, for me, one of the best of times about this pandemic was my younger son and his wife uh, had their first child and our only grandchild so far. She was born, Hannah was born in San Francisco in July. and. Um, they uh, were able to work from home, so they packed up uh, from San Francisco and moved into us with Dallas uh, in Dallas for nine months. And I can tell you, having a little uh, grandchild running around made quarantining and, and uh, surviving this pandemic uh, a lot more enjoyable for us. It was a, a real, a real joy uh, to have her with us. I uh, I told my son and his wife, I'm not changing diapers. I've done that already. Uh, I've been there and done that, um, and uh, for Father's Day last week, he gave me a book on how to change diapers. So, I guess uh, I guess I, uh, I'm going to have to modify a little bit. Um, I've been a student of leadership uh, for a long time. It's just something that I've really spent a lot of time um, thinking about. I blog about it a little bit. I've written a book about it that should come out in a couple months. Um, but uh, one of the two pleasures of my life was spending an afternoon about 10 years ago with Warren Bennis and his wife at their home in Santa Monica. Um, I think I first got the bug of thinking about leadership and what does it mean, what does it mean for me, what does it mean for others, when I read Warren's book on becoming a leader and, and purchased it when it first came out in 1989. 
I have been so fortunate in my career to have worked um, with some of the most unbelievable people. Virtually every one of my bosses that I've worked for in 40 years has retired as a CEO of a company, as a, as a president of a division, or as a corporate officer. Um, it's, it's just been a blessing. I've been so fortunate. So a, a few quick notes before we dive into it. Um, my observations are really mostly focused on the U.S. Um, we do have a very long history of recovering from crises. Uh, there's nothing to get in the way of American ingenuity and entrepreneurship. Virtually everybody's been impacted. There's just nobody that's escaped the effect of what we're going through. And my intention is not to be political. I understand we all have biases. There's all kinds of studies about all kinds of biases. But I'm not here to make a position for or against one way or the other or be political. And I will be mentioning several companies in my presentation. And um, other than having provided executive coaching services to senior physician executives at the Medical University of South Carolina, I have no conflicts um, to report um, with any of the companies that I mentioned. So companies made unprecedented, unprecedented moves at the beginning of this pandemic. There are some companies that moved thousands of people to remote working in absolutely unbelievably quick times. It's just fascinating to me to see how generally command and control and bureaucratic companies can move as quickly as they have. There's, uh, we'll get into some data in a little bit about, uh, tele, uh, about telemedicine. Uh, none of the organizations, I am absolutely convinced, that had major shifts in their use of telemedicine, including the folks at Medicare, would have ever guessed they could have had that kind of uh, situation that quickly. Um, many, many, many companies either pivoted or were forced to pivot uh, to make uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. And um, uh, we'll go through some examples of that. Ford, Ford Motor Company, in early 2020, during the pandemic, cranked out in two and a half weeks 2.5 million face shields. Dyson, the vacuum cleaner company, started um, making uh, ventilators. Business models and analytics for just about everybody were turned upside down. One of the most hardest hit, I think, in terms of pure business analytics was the American uh, airline business. They had absolutely no idea how to respond to the drop in, in revenue and the drop in volumes that occurred. We could, of course, spend the rest of this time talking about all these things, and many of you went through these similar pandemics, and I've picked just a few. Uh, I think, again, what was most impressive for me was the speed at which this occurred. I've never seen large organizations um, move so quickly. Additionally, um, uh, many, many, many people, and I'm sure many of you in the room, volunteered um, to help hospital systems or help companies make PPE, hand out food, um, all kinds of things. Lockheed Martin uh, actually converted a line that makes satellite components uh, into a line that makes PPE. I mean, these things were unprecedented. Can you imagine being an engineer at Lockheed Martin and going to the CEO of the company and say, I'd like to stop making satellite parts and turn out PPE? It'd probably be the last time you're in the CEO's office, right? But it happened, and it happened a lot. And if you look at how that happened in all those organizations, in almost every case, the CEO said, I told people, whatever support you need, go do it. I didn't tell them what to do. They knew what to do. We found people from all, out, all throughout the organization that had talents we didn't even know we had. And I just stepped back, got out of their way, and let people get stuff done. And as a result of that, you can see the agility that, that occurred. In 2019, the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic was recently quoted as saying, in 2019, 2% of our patient visits were done through some sort of telemedicine. During the peak of the pandemic, within two months, it rose up to 75%. The CEO of Ascension Healthcare System said from March of 2020 through March of 2021, we had more than 2 million virtual visits. It's unbelievable. In 2003, it took, 20, it took 13 years to complete the first reference sequence of the full DNA blueprint. Today, we can do it in less than 24 hours. 
we correctly sequenced the full genome of COVID-19 less than one month after the first case was identified. Some centers, as you know, and you may have been involved in some of those centers, created their own, their own PCR or serological tests for, for use on their employees and their organizations. Clinicians rapidly, rapidly tried all kinds of things, very entrepreneurial, to see what they can do to help these people get better. I know a physician who's very involved in wound care down in Louisiana, uh, Kerry Thibodeau, he's one of the nation's leaders in wound care. The first thing he tried to do was stick some of the nurses from his hospital into hyperbaric chambers to see if that would help and get, get people uh, healed quicker with COVID. All kinds of drugs, ECMO, you know it, and you name it, it was unbelievable to see how quick and entrepreneurial people were to try to fight this disease. Remote telesitters um, and ways to monitor patients in the ICU and it minimized the exposure time for um, the caregivers uh, occurred all over the country, and uh, many organizations moved to all kinds of virtual grand rounds. Telemedicine, um, let me go back. In February of 2020, fewer than 1% of Medicare visits were via telehealth. By April, it was almost 50%. That was reported recently by the consulting firm Bain and Company. Uh, clinicians uh, at Medical University of South Carolina started actually using artificial intelligence to review patient charts to see if they could identify people that had symptoms of COVID and, and try to predict whether or not they would become sicker as a result of that. Uh, many of us were adversely affected by the drop in elective surgeries, um, which, which harmed a lot of people. And um, we had, however, if you think about it, and the stories uh, are absolutely unbelievable, we had unprecedented cooperation and coordination of people developing and manufacturing vaccines all around the world. It was, it was, we've never seen anything like it in any of our careers, and I'm not sure we'll ever see it again, frankly. But the type of cooperation uh, that happened was game-changing. Telemedicine has become very hot, um, and uh, Walmart purchased a company called MeMD. Uh, Amazon's come out and said um, it's going to uh, provide its Amazon care to nearly one million employees. I don't think we know the impact of that um, all on uh, the health outcomes. People will obviously be looking at that for a long time. Um, and we saw major shifts and changes uh, in people having to deal with patients in end-of-life care. Um, and um, um, there were some amazing innovations that came up very quickly to help dying patients get in contact with their loved ones and vice versa. So I've put some takeaways into three buckets um, for us to talk about. One is government, um, what the government did. One is sort of company and organizational, um, and one is, uh, is individual. Um, we have seen, again, <laughs> the challenges um, of uh, our infrastructure. Um, and um, there are still millions of households that either don't have access to broadband and internet capabilities, or if they do have access, they can't afford it. And this is a huge problem for all of us in this room involved in healthcare, particularly when we're dealing with rural hospitals. Um, for communities of color in the United States, home broadband continues to lag behind the rest of the country. According to a 2021 Pew uh, report, 34% of black households and 39% of Latino households do not have wired broadband connection. Can you imagine surviving the pandemic, any of us in our businesses, and you didn't have access to broadband and internet? You couldn't have done what you did. It's unbelievable. The Census Bureau recently found that Native Americans are the least connected population, with 33% lacking a broadband subscription, and 47% of those living on tribal lands lack broadband availability. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. States, states are actually trying in some cases to limit the ability of public health officials in their states 
because they don't like the way their public health officials responded to the pandemic. Well, what's my job if I'm a public health official and I can't do my job because the governor and other people have stepped in saying, I don't want you to do what you're doing. And PPE has um, now become a conversation about national security. Should we allow all of our PPE to be made off the shores of the, of the US? A lot of it's made overseas, and a lot of it's made overseas because it costs so much less, right? We've all had pressure of costs in everything we've done in this business, and as a result, of that cost pressure, we've looked for ways to make things as inexpensively as possible. I think there's going to be lots of discussions about PPE, the national stockpile, and how we're going to respond to that. I can tell you, having worked for a company that had about one, ha one half of 1% 1 of the mask business at one point, when the flu outbreak or happened in like 2012, um, we sold out of PPE masks in about three hours. So when this thing heated up in January of last year, uh, I had no idea, none of us had any idea what was gonna happen, but I can tell you I went online and bought my PPE back in January uh, before the crisis really happened. We have so much work to do in this country to help working families and working mothers, and it's gonna be a huge challenge as companies move to go back into a face-to-face -face environment. There was an article uh, recently published in the Harvard Business Review that said pandemic-related job and income losses have been much higher for women and, than men around the globe. As a business leader, it's important that you act now to address this disparity and retain women in your organization, especially as you consider returning to office. There are 190 some odd countries in the United Nations. Only a few do not mandate paid parental leave. New Guinea is one of them, Suriname, and a small little country called the United States of America. We have some of the most embarrassing I believe parental leave policies of any country in the world. And we gotta do something about that. Because we know it's not good for health, it's not good for the family, it's not good for the parents, it's not good for the child. But we continue not to do anything about it. And I think it's embarrassing. Some of the things that we've seen, we've known for a long time. Good stuff happens when we trust people. Good stuff happens when we're empowering people, when we're focused on results and being and able and thinking of a mindset that we can do, we can be agile, right? We've learned to innovate through this pandemic and there's been so many wonderful examples of it. Um, and command and control doesn't always work in all situations. Someone mentioned earlier about stress and about well-being. It's a huge problem for us right now, a huge problem. There's unprecedented level of stress in the U.S. workforce. Many people are not sure how they can go back to work, if they'll go back to work, when will they go back to work, if they'll go back to work directly. 42% of Americans reported symptoms of anxiety and depression in December 2020, four times higher than the previous year. Deaths from overdose grew 25% from August 2019 to August 2020. More so than ever, we've got to focus on the whole person. We've got to focus on the whole person. Said another way, well-being cannot be left to chance anymore. We've just got to do more as a nation and as leaders and as managers to help the well-being of the people that are working with us. Sanjay Gupta said recently on an interview on CNN um, that sitting, in his mind, sitting is the new smoking of this next generation. How many of us sat at our computer for eight hours, 10 hours, 
days at a time, weeks at a time, and never got up and never moved. As we look at how we can have an impact on our people that are working with us and working for us, we've got to help them understand that you can't sit all day long at a computer and do work. You can't do it. I mean, you can. We've all done it. We've probably all been doing it. I did it. But we can't do that. We've got to get up. We've got to take breaks. We've got to take care of our mental health. I think we will see, for those of us in competitive environments, competition that we've never seen before. It is going to be staggering because people have realized they can move, they can move quickly, and they can do a lot more with a lot less. I personally am very um, interested to see what's going to happen for a lot of the large companies I'm very familiar with. If you're Abbott Laboratories, if you're Johnson & Johnson, if you're Medtronic, you can name whatever company you like. What's going to happen? I talked to a gentleman who's with a large medical device company. They have 8,000 salespeople in the U.S. Cost them $3 billion a year to support those salespeople. He said, we're trying to figure out how many of those 8,000 people we need. I don't know what's going to happen. I wish I could tell you that I knew what was going to happen, but I'm fascinated to see what's going to happen because how companies now are going to market and access they have to key customers is and has changed and changed forever. 90% of executives felt that the pandemic will fundamentally change how we do business over the next five years but few feel well equipped. That was a recent McKinsey survey. The pandemic has tested leaders and will continue to do so for a very long period of time. I personally believe that great leaders um, will harness the learning from this pandemic and those leaders that happen to have strong capabilities and learning agility will be best positioned to be most successful. Leaders that are learning agile constantly apply the things that they've learned from their previous experiences into new experiences. And learning agility, I think, has always been important. It's going to be more important than ever. And interestingly enough, inertia. Inertia right now is riskier than, than action. You're better off doing something than doing nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a unique moment for those of us here today to lead ourselves, our companies, and to help the nation get back on its feet. Someone mentioned early on about using this opportunity for cooperation, collaboration, and partnership. I'd love to see nothing more come of this. Let's pick one thing, one thing, one small thing, and let's all try to work together to change that one thing. We have the energy, we have the brains, we have the capabilities to do that. I participated in a meeting similar to this several years ago with learning and development people that were all executive coaches, and we spent a day locked up uh, with Marshall Goldsmith. And out of that came a working group of about 60 people that decided we're going to try to change something in the world. Marshall supported it, and we all met for quite a while. It eventually kind of went on the wayside. But Let's figure out what we can all do to make an impact going forward because there's so many people that have so many needs uh, and it's all about why we do what we do in the business of healthcare. Um, as I mentioned to you, I'm in the process of putting um, my final thoughts. Uh, one of the things I did on the, during the pandemic was work on uh, a book, um, sort of 40 years reflection on observations about leadership in healthcare and um, I put cards on some of your desks. If you'd like a copy or like me to notify you when it comes out, be happy to do that. If you'd like a chapter when it's done, I'd be happy to send you one. If you want to stay in touch, feel free to fill out a card and hand it to me or just hit me up on LinkedIn. So again, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. I look forward to getting to know many of you uh, very well, and I look forward to the future ahead because I think we've got great things to accomplish here. Um, in the health and wellness of uh, the population, not only in the U.S., but around the world. So thank you very much for the opportunity.